you are in a practice set. Okay, hello. Hi, it's Kathy Frey here from IMCO, from the International Integrative Maternity Healthcare Organization. And welcome along to this week's webinar. And this week we are thrilled to have here Karina Fitch. Karina, say hello. Hello, so happy to be here with all of you. It is great to have you here. And you're going to be talking about um, a topic which is really quite dear to my heart and I think a lot of um, mum and health professionals heart and that is postnatal depression and how it can be prevented um, and so look the format of today is that um, I'm just going to um, introduce Karina to you and um, then she's got a fantastic powerpoint that she's going to be going over filled with a lot of information that she wants to to impart and we'll also have a Q&A at the end so um, if, if you have any questions for Karina do just type them into that um, Q&A button at the bottom of your screen usually it's at the bottom of most people's screen and uh, we'll absolutely make sure that we cover those off in this session um, and of course um, We'd love to hear whereabouts in the world you are from, for those of you that are tuning in live with us, um, what your role is and whereabouts you are in the world, and don't hesitate to put that into the chat. That would be really great for us to, to know about. But to, to firstly, just to introduce Karina to you, um, Karina uh, is a certified professional midwife, um, and she's also a transformational facilitator um, and a registered NICU nurse with 22 years of experience in that field of maternity and newborn care. And boy, what a neat combination that is, being a midwife and a NICU nurse. Um, she is also a mother of three daughters and, uh, you know, like, like all of us with kids, each one of them brought their own deeper meaning into our lives as they arrive and um, exist in our, in our realm. And um, after the first, her first daughter was born, she became intensely focused on helping clients bond with their babies in utero and to cultivate um, self-care practices that would serve them as mothering. And then after the third, her third daughter was born, she developed postpartum depression um, and anxiety, which further peaked her interest um, in the nervous system regulation and maternal wellness. And um, I've shared with uh, Karina the fact that we have a similar journey because after my third, that's when I experienced postnatal depression and um, soon found out, you know, it's nothing to do with the baby. It's all to do with everything else being a little out of whack. Um, and yeah, so welcome, welcome Karina. And um, yeah, let me, you, you introduce yourself to everyone as well and tell them a little bit more about your background. Yeah, um, well, I can actually, it's actually built into my presentation. So yeah, let's do that. And, and start, um, share my screen. Okay. Fantastic. So, can you see it? Yep, that's excellent. Yep. Okay, great. So postpartum depression, let's talk prevention. Um, thankfully, over the last several years, postpartum depression is now something that most people know is a, is a big problem. And so, you know, it has become the most common complication of pregnancy, not, not only postpartum depression, but perinatal mood disorders in general, which include a variety of, of different mental health disorders. And so now the question and the conversation really needs to shift to how can we be proactive in preventing this number one complication of pregnancy? And I will share a little bit more about myself. Um, oh, this is what we're gonna cover today. Sorry, I forgot about this slide. So we're gonna talk about maternal wellness and its relationship to societal wellness, our current context as it relates to maternal health, uh, we're going to look, the biggest thing that I really want you to take away from today is this piece around shifting our lens uh, on how we view these mood disorders. 
we're going to look at the four pillars of maternal wellness and five ways to prevent. So a little bit about me so you understand my context. I, um, I've been in the maternity care field now for 25 years. I started out as a doula and moved pretty quickly into becoming a midwife. I've had a, a home birth practice in South Florida for 22 years and just recently moved back to my, um, the community that I was born in, which is the farm, which is very well known in the natural birth world because of Ina May. And so I'm now practicing here on the farm. I am also a registered nurse and specialized in neonatal intensive care. And this is me attending the birth of, uh, of a second time mama. And with my little baby tucked in, my, my second daughter. Um, I'm also a facilitator and I've been facilitating pregnancy groups, postpartum groups, and other special rites of passage ceremonies for women. And I am trained in traditional postpartum Moroccan medicine. I am also the mother of three beautiful daughters and a survivor of postpartum depression and anxiety after the birth of my third, um, as Kathy mentioned. So, so this work is very near and dear to me. So let's look at our current context. Right now, people are living, conceiving, gestating, birthing, and becoming mothers inside of a global pandemic, which hopefully we are emerging from, but you know, we, we've thought that before, so we're still in it. Um, a major reckoning around race and social justice, and we're looking at systemic racial inequities in maternal and infant health outcomes that, are, that were always there, but are now being really exacerbated and brought to the light as a result of the pandemic. And then changes in work environments, the loss of jobs, uh, learning how to work remotely, learning how to work remotely and homeschool our kids at the same time, and social isolation. So all of these things uh, lend to an increase in the stress hormones for pregnant people. So cortisol, adrenaline, norepinephrine, and that flight, fight, or freeze response, which obviously is, is not ideal when you are gestating a baby. So perinatal mood disorders now occur in 20%, approximately 20% of pregnant women and people and postpartum women. So this, this includes pregnancy and anxiety during, I'm uh, sorry, uh, depression and anxiety during the pregnancy and postpartum. Also obsessive compulsive disorder um, and bipolar and PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. And that comes up more postpartum as a result often of birth trauma. So this is a big slice of the pie and, and should be a wake up call to, you know, start begin to look at what, what are we doing wrong and what can we do differently? So I wanna share this quote from Howard Haggard, who was the, um, the head of the, of, of the Yale Applied Physiology Department. And he said in 1929, the position of women in any civilization is an index of the advancement of that civilization. And the position of woman can best be gauged by the care given to her at the birth of her child. So it was recognized nearly a hundred years ago by a male physician, this link, this direct link between maternal wellness and societal wellness. And we need to start to, to really um, look at that because you know, moms are that, that maternal child bond, that's the basis for all the other relationships that we have in our life. And so if moms are, are not well, nobody is going to be well. And, and, and the whole culture and the whole society is going to suffer as a result. And that is what we're seeing right now. And the truth, as Beth Berry says, the truth is that we are not struggling because we are inadequate. We are struggling because we are mothering within a society that is misrepresenting, misleading, and inadequately supporting us. So we have to stop looking at moms as the source of the problem. You know, we are really struggling. In, uh, in America, there's a survey that's done annually by Motherly, which is a very large media outlet, and uh, looking at the health of, and wellness of mothers. And the last survey reported that 93% of mothers are feeling burnt out. And it's like, we're doing all the things We're you know, we're trying to be the best care providers, the best financial providers, the best partners. We've had to take on other roles like homeschooling our kids. 
and we're just going, going, going. And we feel this, this, this sense of not being enough, this sense of inadequacy, and it's really not our fault. And that's something that we, we need to start to acknowledge. So it's time to shift our lens and start to see that mothers are not broken. The system is broken. And this quote uh, by Rochelle Garcia Saliga, who is another midwife and cultural pioneer, she says, postpartum depression and anxiety are, are a normal response to a culture that isn't supporting mothers. And this is so profound and so true, especially when you start to understand the hormonal physiology of, of the postpartum time. So most of us have heard of the hormone oxytocin. If you're a provider, you definitely know it. If you are a mother, you've probably heard about it. It is the hormone that plays a big role in pregnancy and, and in birth. It's the hormone that makes the uterus contract and labor. And it's the hormone that is like the glue of the mother and infant bond. Uh, we receive a huge surge of oxytocin in that first hour after the birth. And it's really the foundation for attachment. So oxytocin also plays a big role postpartum. And some of the things that it, that it offers us is that it, um, it makes us a lot more capable of reading nonverbal cues, which is obviously important when we're, when we're taking care of tiny humans that can't speak. Uh, it, it, it increases our capacity for empathy. It makes us betty, better multitaskers. Um, and it also uh, helps us to deal with monotony, which I think is so interesting. When I learned this, it was just fascinating to me because, you know, that's, it's, that, those first two years as a mother, it's kind of like Groundhog's Day, right? You wake up and it's the same thing every day. We're nursing, we're changing diapers, we're doing laundry, we're making meals, we're sleeping and showering and eating and repeating over and over again. So it's very, very monotonous. And so oxytocin comes on board to help us be able to tolerate that more. And the last, one of the last thing that it does is it makes us sort of hyper vigilant. It brings out the protector in us. And this was really important many years ago when we were living more in the wild and, and needed to, you know, be that fierce protector of our baby um, against attack from wild animals or, or other um, natural forces. And when we are in a space where we feel unsafe or we're under supported, then oxytocin is going to push us from that hypervigilance into an anxi anxiety state. So it does make us more prone to anxiety. And that is why uh, postpartum anxiety is actually more common than postpartum depression. And so that's why it's so important that we do have those support systems in place. And then this is another big piece. This is about acknowledgement. And I wanted to share this quote by Dr. Aurele Athan. And she says, understanding that motherhood is the psychological and spiritual birth of a woman is the greatest story never told. It makes a tremendous difference. We can see in ancient cultures that we're meant to be handed down information as we move through these stages of life. Those who have done it before need to pass down the knowledge to those who have yet to do it. That is the way that it is meant to happen. And when that doesn't happen, when we don't have those markers or acknowledgements, we feel lost. And I think this is where we are right now. We've really lost those markers. We've lost those, um, those rites of passage ceremonies, those ways that we acknowledge that, you know, this is actually a really big deal. When we become mothers, we experience probably what's the most profound identity shift of our lifetime. And it involves a lot of different changes. It involves changes in our brains, um, hormonal changes, physical changes, right? Our body literally changes form and grows a baby. Um, it involves psychological and emotional changes, spiritual changes, and even economic and financial changes in our life. So it's a really big deal. And there's actually a, a word that describes this process of mother becoming. And, and that word is matrescence. So this was a term that was coined by Donna Raphael back in the seventies that refers to that process of mother becoming. And 
you know, my feeling is like, if we, if we are going through this, this huge transformation of identity, and yet it is not really recognized and it's unnamed, it, then it's basically invisible. And how do you support a process that's invisible? You really can't. And so uh, we need to begin to make, my, one of my missions is to make this a, a household word, just like adolescence, right? We've all heard of the word adolescence. We've been through it uh, because there's a name for it. And it's, it's a name, you know, adolescence refers to all those same changes that happen when we are, you know, moving into our teen years. And the changes that happen in matrescence are actually probably 10 times more powerful than adolescence. And yet my guess is that many of you here have never heard of this word. And I myself, I learned this word about three years ago and I've been in maternity care for, for 25 years. So, um, you know, it's been 50 years since the word was, the term was coined and it's time that it becomes part of our, our language. So let's talk for a minute about the four pillars of maternal wellness. So these are nutrition and hydration, which is obviously super important. That's what's gonna be growing our babies and providing for our own physiological needs and, and building our hormones. Um, and, and then rest is the second pillar. Rest is something that is very much undervalued and underappreciated in our, in our culture, which is very much focused on productivity and just constantly go, go, go all the time. So we have become a culture that doesn't even know how to rest anymore. So many people are taking different types of supplements to help them sleep at night. So we need to really emphasize the importance of rest. Exercise is the third pillar. Exercise has been shown to be just as effective as medication in, in terms of treating depression and anxiety. Uh, it's very important during pregnancy because it, because of that, because of the mental health stuff, but also just in terms of being in good shape for the birth and, and studies have shown that it will, um, that it decreases the length of labor if you exercise regularly during pregnancy. And the fourth pillar is emotional well-being, And part of that is, is um, connecting with your baby, you know, be beginning that process of connection while your baby is still inside you. And then of course, just in general, you know, managing your stress, uh, eliminating sources of stress that, that you can remove from your life. Uh, pregnancy is a great time to take things off of your plate, to take things that are really triggering out of your life if you can. And if you cannot, then learning some good coping techniques. So these four pillars is something that I talk about at my very first prenatal visit with my clients. And we continue to check in about these at each and every visit. And now let's talk about prevention. So what I've come up with as five crucial steps for prevention are number one, acknowledgement. And we've touched on this already, the, the matrescence piece, the idea that, you know, this is a big deal. This is a rite of passage and we need to have things in place that, that acknowledge that. The second is preparation and screening. So everyone gets all excited and talks a lot about their birth plan. And there's nothing wrong with that. Birth plans are great as long as you're flexible because they're usually not how you plan. Your births are usually not how you plan them, but it is great to have a birth vision. Um, and then we don't really plan or prepare for the postpartum. And the birth is, you know, maybe a few hours at most a, a couple days of your life, but postpartum is forever. So we have to begin prenatally planning for the postpartum. And I'm gonna get into what some of that includes. And then screening. Screening for postpartum or for perinatal mood disorders should happen during the pregnancy at least once, if not every trimester. And then again, postpartum. We're gonna look at the physiological care, uh, the physiological needs of postpartum women and the postpartum pause, which is basically a practice that is, that happens in cultures all around the world of taking about 40 days, it's pretty much about 40 days across, across the board where that mother is gonna be at home. She's gonna be resting and taking care of her baby and she has no other responsibilities. That is the ideal. That's, you know, as far as like 
making this transition more smooth and setting her up for success. Um, and then we're going to look at support and ceremony and ceremony ties back into acknowledgement. The ceremonies are for the purpose of, of acknowledgement and support. So creating your postpartum plan, this should be a plan that includes support people, both professional support people like your midwife, your obstetrician, um, a mental health counselor, perhaps a lactation consultant, a doula, all of these are wonderful support people on a professional level. And then also your community and your family support. So you want to make a plan for that. You want to let people know that you're going to be counting on them, that you need their help in this very vulnerable time. There should be a plan for meals, a plan for rest, a plan for childcare. If this, you know, if you have older children, um, body work, right? Pregnancy and birth take a huge toll on our body. And so across the board in traditions around the world, there's certain types of body work that happen postpartum. And then you want to make a plan for uh, you know, how you're going to manage your finances and when you, how much time you can take off, when, you, when are you going to return to work? And then, like I said before, every pregnant person should be screened during the pregnancy and again, postpartum. And there are several options out there. I personally really like the EDPS, the Edinburgh postnatal scale, um, which can be used prenatally as well. And it's just nice and simple. It's a 10 question form. And I think that one of the reasons that providers don't screen is that they don't know what to do if, if somebody screens positive. They don't have those referral um, sources in place. So that's something that uh, we can do as providers. And these, you know, talking about these planning for the postpartum, talking about emotional well being, this is something that is ongoing at each and every visit. So here are some practices that providers can do to promote maternal emotional wellness. The first one is empathetic listening. So try not to ignore or belittle concerns. Sometimes it seems certain clients are worried about every little thing and it can be frustrating as a provider, but just know that this is, you know, most of the, most of the time that's, it's their first baby and there's a lot of unknowns that they're navigating. And I know that providers also run up against the um, struggle about time, you know, they don't have a lot of time to spend with each client, which is something that is a systems level problem that really needs to change. But you'd be surprised at even just how much, you know, five minutes of just really active, empathetic listening, what that can do for your clients. Start talking about stress navigation and the importance of emotional wellness at the very first prenatal visit and check in at every single visit. Okay, and this could be something simple like, how's your stress level been in the last month? Or how are your spirits? Um, how, how are you feeling? You know, just open-ended question to try to see what's going on. Screen your patients, regardless of whether or not you think they're at risk. Um, one of the things about postpartum depression or, or during the pregnancy is that this is a time of your life when, when there's sort of this expectation that we're going to be happy, that it's a joyful time. And there is a lot of joy and beauty in it, of course, but not everyone is going to feel that way all the time. And they might be navigating a lot of other very stressful things in their life. So even if you think that they have no risk factors, they should be screened and then make sure you have a referral list for those who screen positive. And that includes organizations like Postpartum Support International, which is a, a great uh, resource for information, for referrals. I believe they have a, a hotline or a helpline. And then you want to look in your own local community for who's doing pregnancy groups or postpartum groups. Who, who are the mental health counselors in your, in your community that specialize with pregnant people and postpartum people? And that way you don't have to have any fear around like, oh my gosh, what if they, they scream positive? What do I do now? Then you can just hand them this list let them know that there is help available. Create a calm environment. Uh, I can't tell you how many clients I have that, that come to me after having an experience in the traditional medical model. And they talk about how they would leave their prenatal visits in tears or with more anxiety than they went in with. So when you, you, know, you walk into a, a waiting area and often there's a, 
a TV and it's very cold and now everyone's, you know, masked, you can't really see people's faces. So all those things are going to increase the, the mother's anxiety. So if you can make it a little warmer, you could have some, maybe some, an essential oil diffuser with some lavender diffusing and maybe some calm music rather than the TV blaring. All these things can make a huge difference for the nervous system. And then practice shared decision-making. So one of the things that, the biggest things that causes PTSD as it relates to pregnancy and birth experiences is that women feel like when they didn't have any control, when they didn't have a voice, when they were not asked to take part in the decision-making process for their care, that that was the thing that was most triggering. And so coercion is never okay when it comes to um, medical decision-making and it leads to increased maternal stress. So we really have to make sure that when we're going to present, you know, either a treatment option or a diagnostic option that we are presenting it number one, as an option that we're taking the time to go through the full informed consent process. We're providing information about the benefits and the risks and the alternatives, including the alternative to do nothing. Um, and then we're taking time to answer questions so that by the end of all that, you know, your, your client is in a really good place to make an informed decision. So physical, physiological needs during the postpartum pause. So these are things that are practiced. They're sort of like the cross-cultural prescription for postpartum. And because they're practicing cultures around the world, what we are beginning to understand is that these are actually physiological needs of the postpartum body. So there's a need for warmth. Uh, and the reason for this is that during pregnancy, our metabolism is increased. There, there have been studies now that show that um, pregnancy is essentially like running a marathon for 10 months. That's what it does to our metabolism. So lots of heat in the body. Uh, the baby obviously is providing heat. And so when we give birth, we're losing heat. We're also losing blood, which from um, a Chinese medicine standpoint is synonymous with heat and chi or life force. So that's why we need pregnancy or postpartum is, is more of a cold state and we need to bring warmth back in. There's a huge need for rest. And this is, you know, obviously recovering from the birth, but also recovering from the, the whole pregnancy where we were like athletes for 10 months, we were running a marathon in our bodies. So we need rest, lots and lots of rest, special foods. And we're going to get into that in a minute and special types of body work. So I'll be sharing a little bit about what is done in Morocco, because that is the training that I did. But, um, but certainly things like chiropractic, you know, your body goes through a huge shifting physically. So getting, getting yourself back in order on a chiropractic level is important. Um, I think all postpartum women and people should see a pelvic floor, uh, PT, um, because there's a lot of shifting that goes along there. Um, and then things like acupuncture, um, massage, uh, you know, in, I believe it's in India, the midwife comes for like the first month and gives a massage every day to the postpartum woman. And I just think that is so awesome because I love massage and I know how, you know, you, you're so sore after you give birth and then you're breastfeeding and you're kind of hunched over a lot of the time. So there's so much tension that can get built up in the body. This is another quote from Rochelle Garcia Saliga. And she says, a thriving postpartum period has a rippling healing effect in our family lines for generations to come. So I know in Morocco, and I believe this is true in, in many other cultures, that first 40 days is considered a very vulnerable time. And so what happens during that time, the healing that takes place or does not take place actually affects, they say it affects the next 40 years. So that's huge. That, and that's why we call it, it's, it's known as a critical period of development. And a critical period by definition means like a short amount of time where a lot goes on and it has a long lasting um, impact. So this postpartum time is really crucial for, for women to be cared for properly because it will affect them uh, even into their menopause. 
So as far as prevention of mood disorders prenatally, we know that these are the nutrients that are often uh, deficient in mood disorders. And in fact, iron deficiency anemia is the number one, uh, or, or depression is the number one misdiagnosis for iron deficiency anemia, meaning that you know, women are, are diagnosed with depression, but really they're just anemic. And if, if you knew that and you were testing for it, you could, it's a, it's a pretty easy remedy. Uh, magnesium also has been shown to be highly effective in, in helping with depression in general, including postpartum, uh, as well as omega-3s, vitamin D. And, um, and they've done studies with the, the bottom three where they've supplemented during pregnancy and seen uh, a, a decrease in the rate of depression postpartum. So nutrition across the board in, in various cultures, these are the general guidelines. And this is a huge topic. I could do you know, a whole webinar on this or a whole course on this, but some of the basic, um, basic ideas are that we want thing, food that is warm. And that means both temperature wise, we don't wanna serve the mama cold food. Why? Again, because we're trying to bring warmth back to the body. If you give cold, it, it requires more work for the body. So we wanna make things really easy for digestion. The postpartum time is a time of, of healing and restoration. And so we're not producing as much digestive enzymes during this time. So we don't wanna eat raw foods that are harder to digest. Everything should be cooked. Um, and so warm as far as temperature and also as far as uh, spice. So like, you know, some of the great spices for postpartum would be ginger and cinnamon and black pepper, bring a little heat back into the body. Um, soups and bone broths are excellent for the postpartum body. And the food should be very nutrient dense. So high protein, high fat. Um, and, and if you are working with uh, grains or legumes, so you know your rice, quinoa, um, oats, or even nuts too, also um, any kind of bean, you want to soak it the night before. It should be soaked first uh, because that'll make it much easier to digest before, and then, and then you'll cook it, of course. And then herbal teas. So some of the great herbs for postpartum are the Nora tea, which you may have heard of. Nora is nettles, oat straw, red raspberry, and alfalfa. This is a great tea during pregnancy. It tones the uterus and um, the, the nettles and alfalfa really support uh, nutritionally and support the kidneys. Um, the oat straw is great for, for circulation, for varicosities. And then um, anise and fennel tea are, are good for um, milk production. But it's a great way to get all the fluids in that you need and, um, and give yourself a little bit of, of healing support from the herbs as well. Community care. This is a huge aspect. So so we know what the physiological needs are of the postpartum body, and we can't rely on the partner alone to provide all of that support. You know, we're talking about the childcare support, the meal support, um, support so that she can get some rest. So we really need to build our community. And this is a, a pregnancy circle I used to do, and I still do, but now we have to do it outdoors because of COVID. So this was pre-COVID and um, look at the smiles on these, these mama's faces. You know, they're just glowing. And that's what I find happens when you bring pregnant women together. Because for hundreds of years, pregnant women have come together around processes like menstruation, pregnancy, birth, motherhood, breastfeeding, to exchange ideas, to provide support, and just to be together. When you, know, when you, when you get together with other pregnant women, everyone's oxytocin levels go up, which is only a good thing. Um, and so... They, what I noticed is when I started doing these group prenatals is that these women would start to exchange numbers and really start to build communities. So when it, after they had their babies, they had built their village. And this is absolutely crucial because you're gonna need your village for meals, for childcare support, for um, you know, rest support. So it really does take a village, not just to raise a child, but to raise a mother. This is my postpartum group. Again, this was before COVID. Um, but one of the things that really 
uh, I think leads to a lot of depression is shame and shame thrives in isolation. When we are isolated and we're struggling, we think that we're a horrible mom. We think, oh my God, I should be happy. I should be joyful. I should be in love with my baby. And um, the reality is, is that motherhood is hard. There's a lot of challenges. And when we're not in groups, we think that it's, it's just us. And then we feel a, a lot of shame. We think we're a bad mom. So, so important to, to be gathering. And then the final piece is ceremony. So around the world there in traditional societies, there have been ceremonies to honor this rite of passage. And these are pictures from my blessing way at where my community came together to offer me a blessing. Um, some of the things in this ceremony are borrowed with, with much um, respect and reverence from the Navajo tradition, the, the washing of the feet that you see here is a Navajo tradition. And that is to symbolize the fact that we, that I will be walking a new path as a mother. Um, so we're blessing, we're blessing the feet before that. The labyrinth here that you see on the right is, is um, just one of my all time favorite uh, symbols that I like to work with, particularly with pregnant and, and postpartum women. And then these are some of the images from Morocco. So in Morocco, um, the, the new mother is called the Nafsa. So she has a, a special name, a special title. She's treated like a queen, like a bride. She's adorned. Uh, they do a lot of henna to, to adorn her. And then these are some of the um, traditions that they do there as far as bringing heat to the body, steaming, steaming massage and um, in the upper left there that's a closing of the bones ceremony and that is also practiced in many other countries including in central america and south america um, and that's to you know bring both physical closure and emotional spiritual closure after the birth because you know in that birth process we have to open on so many levels it's not just physical and so it's a really beautiful way to bring closure to the whole childbearing year and then on the bottom left you can see some of the traditional foods for the nafsa and so finally i just want to end with a quote and um, this is from barbara kate rothman she says birth is not just about making babies Birth is about making mothers, strong, competent, capable mothers who trust themselves and know their inner strength. And I think until we begin to really understand this, um, until we begin to see that birth is not just childbirth, it's also mother birth, then there's no way that we can adequately support it. So um, I hope you enjoyed and I'm open to any questions now. Oh, that was just so wonderful. Thank you so very, very much. Um, uh, Karina, you do such a wonderful summary of that information. And I really think that the, um, you know, those five crucial steps of prevention, I, I can't emphasize enough how absolutely on point you are when you, you've listed those five, they make such a difference. And for you know anybody out there who is watching this video at any time and you're maybe a, a ex, you're expecting a first baby, um, you know, and, and you're thinking, yeah, do I really need to worry about that? Yeah, you want to put all of you want to put effort into all of those areas while you're pregnant. Um, yeah. And it's it's funny, isn't it, that like, um, I know that when I was um, caseloading myself as a 24-7 um, a old poor midwife, 50% of my clients would be Asian or Indian. And uh, often you would see these, uh, you know, amazing ceremonies uh, or acknowledgements that would be part of their culture. And um, for us that happen to have been born into this world, um, European and a Caucasian culture, um, we often are, are missing all of that. And yeah. we've lost it along the way. And there, there aren't those ceremonies and acknowledgements and rites of passage. And, and um, I would have to say, I, I don't know, I, it's almost like um, 
I would have to say, I think that as Europeans uh, in Western culture, we do this really badly. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and I like that you said that we've lost it because truly, if you go back, every, every culture has these things. Yeah. Uh, we just, it, we lost it a long, a long time ago and, and we need to, to find our, our ways and, and to resurrect it. And, 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 you know, I didn't really talk much about um, also just on a social level, like I know Australia does pretty good with this, but here in the U S we don't even have mandated paid maternity leave. Um, you know, that's something that is based on your employer or the state. We're working on it to get it at a federal level, but that's just, it's just unbelievable that that, that that is not in place as a societal support. So that's, you know, we have to work on all fronts, you know, in a, on an individual level, in terms of our own wellness, um, on a community level, and on a, a society and cultural level. Yeah, and I mean, that comes down to those comments and statements that you, you were saying is that, you know, we, we can see the health of the societies reflected by you know how much emphasis we put on looking after our new mothers yeah. um yeah um and just some other things i'll throw in there um the uh, matrescence is uh for those that haven't heard that word um yeah it's it, it needs to become <laughs> so needs to become um you know just a, a something that people are, are so familiar with because you know as you say we do understand the word adolescence that it's that change and matrescence is the change from a woman you know becoming a mother that first time um and a, a little while ago here on these talks we had um alexandra sex um, interviewed and she's got a very um, well-known TED talk on matrescence so um, if that's an you know uh, I would encourage anybody to you know look that one up um, uh, just google it and you can find her you know her TED talk on that she covers that very very well um, I guess some of the other um, I've made some notes when you you've been talking um oh i know that we talk about statistically you know 20 percent of women experience um postpartum depression or anxiety but i think that both you and i would agree that we think it's actually more than that um yeah. you know 20 percent is what scientific research is doing but there's there's a lot that kind of um, in that grey area that sort of go under the radar and um, you know because it's not like it, it's not like it's a situation that um, you either do or don't and sometimes there's a real subtlety in there where you sort of you know I know that after I had uh, it wasn't until after I had our third that I realized things were really out of whack. <laughs> oh, yeah. This yeah. is not, I'm not my normal self here. What's going on? And, yeah. um, and, but at that point, I could recognize that I probably really had a little bit after my second, but it was subtle enough that even I wasn't sure. Yeah. Right. So there's that whole sort of, um, kaleidoscope of 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 levels um but if we said that um if we kind of said that about one and three would have some kind of level of feeling of that uh it's yeah. definitely at least one and four you know it's it, this is super common right and even just you know the the statistic around burnout 93 percent. i mean that's that's huge so you know horrendous it's outrageous yeah outrageous 93 percent of women are feeling burnout wow yeah yeah it's just a, yeah it's yeah very much insane but um i would completely agree with you that those prevention that putting things in place while you are pregnant to get ready for that postnatal period is so important um and makes such a difference. And, you know, it, it tends to be um, this big focus around the birth, the birth, the birth, the birth. And we said the birth is incredibly important in this whole journey, of course. Um, but it is like we sort of tend to drop the ball and, and what else have we got ready um, for that woman afterwards? 
Yeah. Um, yeah. I think postpartum is just really underestimated in terms of how, mm. what, how intense it is, what a big transformation it is. And, and it's not just with the first baby. I mean, each mm. one brings, you're, you're entering a new process of matrescence and matrescence is something that doesn't have an endpoint, <laughs> really, you know, it's like, yes. it's really the rest of your life. It's not something that happens overnight. It's a process and it, and it starts over each time you have another baby. So we really have to be planning for that postpartum time. And, and, uh, I forgot to mention that I, I'm creating, you know, there's so many templates out there for creating your birth plan. So mm-hmm. I am, am creating one for a postpartum plan that will help you, you know, kind of sort out all the things that you should have on it. And, um, if, if anyone wants, is interested in that, if you go on my website and, and get on my mailing list, I'll make sure that you get it. And it's in the works right now. I, I keep having Fantastic. lots of births. So. <laughs> that's, a, that's a really good point. Do you want to just go over your contact details as well now, Karina? Sure. Yeah. And I'm just moving because mm. my battery is low. Um, so my website is, um, motherfly, www.motherfly.mom. So it's, I just want to clarify that it's dot mom, not dot com. So it's uh, M O T H E. So motherfly, other and then F L Y dot M O M. Yes, exactly. And then you can find me on Facebook at Motherfly and uh, on Instagram, it's Motherfly Tribe. Fantastic. Um, And tell us about. uh, any other resources, particularly for, I guess, our maternity health professionals um, that they may be able to, resources of yours that they may be able to share with their woman or um, what? Yeah. yeah. So I have, um, I have a PDF that's like a self-care for mama's guide, um, which is actually really more about self-compassion, which I think is, is really the foundation for self-care. You can't really do self-care if you don't have compassion for yourself. Um, and, and it's like, we all know what self-care is, but moms are, are not great at doing it because that, that compassion piece is missing. So, um, so it's a really lovely, colorful PDF. And then I also have a, a guided audio fetal love break practice, uh, that that's for pregnant women to listen to and, um, and just take a moment to, to connect with their babies and, uh, and I also have an article about just creating that optimal womb environment when you're pregnant. And so it's, it's mostly around stress management, meditation, uh, things that you can do to just make that a really nurturing space for your baby and for yourself. Fantastic. So um, if you were to, if we kind of singled it down, what do you think in your opinion, um, is the like the single most important thing that a pregnant woman can do to avoid, um, you know, depression and anxiety in her postpartum? Yeah, I would say it would be to um, get her support network in place, build her village, you know, because all of the things that we need require a village for us to, to truly have them. So that, and, and in service to that, I also, I, ha- I have a monthly pregnancy group and a monthly postpartum group that is free. It's donation-based, but you don't have to pay anything. So it's on Zoom now. So it's available to anyone who's interested and you can, uh, you can register for those on my website. I think that um, when you say, you know, build your, build your village, you know, while you're pregnant, oh, I just can't agree with you enough on that but it's also um, often a sort of an area where women probably have a a level of uncomfortableness of like going out and asking for help when they haven't even had the baby yet kind of thing Um, and you know so I would often talk explain to the woman that that you know making that 40 days um, and is 40 days and 40 nights where all they have to do is look after their baby that's it and um you know so sometimes when you're going out to people for help it's like it's easier for them and it's easier for you if you're almost like really specific about it yes (laughs) you know I mean that that could be right and and rather than saying (laughs) hey I might need some help and um 
you know, because quite often what will happen you, is that after that baby is born, you know, the, the partner may be on taking time off work. Um, and then, you know, maybe the mother's there and the mother-in-law is there and, and maybe a girlfriend's there. And sometimes what happens is that particularly in that first seven days or so, you kind of have more people around than you need. Um, and then suddenly everybody's gone. Right. Yeah. And, you know, so I would often say to women, just an example of, of the ways that they can go out and ask for their help is to almost like create that little roster going on over that first 40 days. Yeah. And yeah, and sort of saying to, you know, saying to your girlfriends um, who've already had babies because they'll really get it. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and it might be saying, hey, for the first month, would, would you bring me dinner every Tuesday night? Would you just be in charge of Tuesday night dinner or whatever right. it is? But, you know, you can. Um, so going out there and creating that village, but giving people, I guess what you want to say to yourself, say to yourself is if what do I need other people to do for me if mm -hmm. I am to do nothing but look after my baby for 40 days and 40 nights? Right. Yeah. And that's what the, the postpartum plan is really going to get into a detail with, right. with all of that. Right. Because, and I, what I've been realizing lately, just with some of the births I've had recently is that we, I need a new handout for the family members of like, <laughs> what, it, what do you, what does it look like to support a postpartum mama? Because yes. people want to come, they want to hold the baby. That's not what she needs. She needs other types of support. And so and, and it doesn't and so always come often, across well if it comes from her. So if it comes from the provider, yeah. you know. Yes. Yeah. And so often don't you find that the, those family members and friends who want to give support, they're actually not sure what to do because they haven't received it themselves. Yeah, exactly. We don't have that intergenerational um, support. Um, right. Yeah. And it's when I look back myself even at my journey of what support I got it's like it was abysmal yeah 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 and it's so true what you said about you know that the first week or maybe two weeks you have all the support and then it kind of drops off so mm. the plan has to be for how you're gonna how you're gonna spread that out so maybe the first week it's your mother then it's your mother-in-law or whoever it is but yeah. having that planned out having a, a meal train so that people can sign yeah. up for slots for that whole first month or, or 40 days, you know, but it definitely needs to be, it needs planning. It requires planning and it yeah. requires something that is, that you mentioned that is not easy for people, particularly women and particularly mothers, mm -hmm. which is asking for support. And I always tell my clients, like, this is the time where you're going to have to build that muscle. It's just a, it's just a practice. We we're not good at it because we've been socialized to be the caretakers. And so it feels very vulnerable to be in a place where we're asking, but, but like you said, the more specific we can be about what our needs are, the more we set people up to, for success in supporting us. If we're just really vague and like, Oh, I need, I need some, I need support. Then people may offer find... other things that you don't need. Yeah, and being kind to ourselves, you know, like, I mean, having, uh, not trying to be, you know, the superwoman, I I so remember this, this very distinct moment after I'd had our third, and um, so I had a two and a half year old and a four and a bit year old, and this brand new baby, mm -hmm. and um, it was like, I don't know, it was something like a um, nine o'clock, we'll say, quarter past nine or something on a Wednesday morning and here I was breastfeeding my baby at my two and a half year old dance class after mm -hmm. already just dropping off um, the four-year-old to preschool so I you know I've, I've got like this baby that's 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 not even probably a week old and I think about it I wow. just wanna, you know it was nuts um yeah. but here's this feeling so I've got up I've, I've got the four-year-old off to preschool I've got the two and a half year old to who dance class and now I am breastfeeding this brand new baby like mm. there was this moment where I thought this is kind of nuts and yeah. you know what I, I had this moment where I went maybe it's not critical 
if my two and a half year old misses her dance classes for a few weeks. Yeah. <laughs> the revelation. You know, like really, now the funny thing is, dancing was a big part of her life and she went on to do it till she was you know she was at dance classes till she was nearly 20 and yeah. um but you know what I really do think that if she missed it for a term or a semester when she was two and a half it probably would not have impacted her dancing <laughs> right down the track. I mean I think that's true and it's also <gasps> true that like if you had support somebody to take her to dance for the first exactly. month well, you know? I, if, if I didn't have the actual support available for someone to take her like it, she, she probably would have been fine missing out yeah but there was yeah. this crazy expectation within myself of thinking this is what I should be doing what I right. need to do what I should be doing and and I wouldn't have even dreamt about asking somebody else to pick her up and take her yeah. So it is like this um, silly wake up call in a way of, of just be really kind to yourself. And, um, you know, I guess you sort of go through, don't we, we, we go through experiences ourselves and we come away from our older and wiser and go, yeah, that was a really silly thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh yeah, so 40 days and 40 nights, can't emphasize that enough, um, you know, and I, I will, when I used to, I don't do home visits so much anymore, so I'm not caseloading in the same way I used to do, but I would say to my woman, you know, if I'm turning up uh, and your baby is under four weeks of age, and when I arrive, you're fully dressed with your makeup on, I'm not going to be happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't want right. to see you fully dressed with your makeup on in the first four weeks of a brand new baby yeah yeah one and of the um childbirth educators in my community who would teach classes she would come to the postpartum class in her pajamas with her hair all disheveled and just to kind of show like this is what postpartum looks like and it's okay I love it I love it. And yeah, just loving in your pajamas. And something really magical happens when you do give reverence to that first 40 days um, and 40 nights. And, and suddenly by the time you get to the end of it, you actually, in fact, sort of within that last sort of week or few days, a lot of women suddenly, they get to this place where they're actually really ready to, to kind of get out into the world a little bit more again maybe a little yeah. bit of sort of almost like cabin fever has come in but not in a negative way it's like a really positive way and they yeah. feel complete and they feel nourished and they feel fulfilled and they've uh, and their baby is more able to um uh, you know be able to cope I used to say to 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 women look until your baby is over five weeks of age and over five kilos don't be taking it out anywhere mm -hmm. um and even that makes the woman kind of stay home a little bit more. Yeah, now. yeah, yeah. Right. Um, but look, we are running out of time. And um, I, I just love, you know, you've done a, a wonderful uh, summary on all of this, Karina. So thank you. And, um, and once that postpartum checklist preparation that you put together is available, yeah, it would be great just to share that it's yeah. it's so needed absolutely yeah thank you for having is me. there anything else that you'd like to finish with as we close um i just want people to understand how um how important it is this acknowledgement piece and and that we we really need to move back into a place of reverence for the role of the mother because mm. this is you know this is the foundational uh relationship from which all of our relationships are built upon so it's really really important that we we revere mothers that we support mothers and um and and we understand the role the the very important role that that we play i love it thank you so much for your time today um, it's just wonderful to have you here and um, and thank you to all of those that have, uh, are live today and uh, I just want to wish you all a wonderful rest of your week and uh, we look forward to seeing you at a future webinar so bye everybody thank you Karina thank you bye, -bye.